Mina, Konbanwa, Jesus Freaking Gamer here. Kind of a part three message. Oh, and hey, check this out. Check this out. I'm starting my timer. I'm getting good. I'm remembering. Okay, I should have done that before the camera started. I'm sorry. I'm getting better. That was an improvement. <laughs> part three. In this little, um, it, I haven't even intended for it to be a series, but it's kind of wound up being one because I wanted to so thoroughly go through chapter two and um, pretty much half of chapter one and a little bit in chapter three from the book of Judges because I thought it was, it's just really meaty stuff. It's really, really good and I feel that I'll never proclaim to have like the entire picture or the entire truth of what the Word of God is trying to say, but I believe I've got a decent picture. I believe I have some understanding, and I believe it's understanding that is accurate and is correct, is biblically on point, and I believe it's something that can minister to me and can minister to you guys, whether you are my freaks or whether you're just some random troll surfing the internet for some Christian to make fun of. I'm your guy. Pay attention to me. Hit that dislike button. Give me views. <laughs> Great way to start off a message. So, taking up where I left off last time, Judges chapter 2, verse 18. And when the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who oppressed them and harassed them. God always cares when we're in a tight spot, when we're in trouble. It's never that he doesn't care. Like all the problems, take all the problems in the world right now. Take every single one of them. All the rape that's going on, all the murder that's going on, all the wars that's going on, all of the, all the lying, the cheating, the stealing, the destruction of families, the destruction of households, the destruction of friendships, the breaking of trust, the breaking of covenants, any and everything from the horrible just to the, you know, kind of not so great, something you would put very mildly, just everything from one end to the other and everything in between. God cares about each and every one of those things as well as each and every one of those people perpetrating those things. And he also cares about all the natural disasters in the world, the earthquakes, the volcanic eruptions, the tsunamis, the things that we humans don't have control of, um, the droughts and the famines, which is life of water and food. God cares about all of those things. He cares about every single one of them. And he does have an answer for every single one of those things. Since he knows everything, it's not that he never doesn't hear our... I don't think I said that correctly. It's not that he doesn't hear our groaning. It's not that he doesn't hear our complaining. It's not that he doesn't genuinely know and care when we need help. He cared for the Israelites at all times. It's never, there was never a point where he was angry and then he ceased to, and then he ceased caring. And then, oh, well, he started caring again and he stopped being angry. That's not how it works. I'm trying to think of an analogy like, okay, you got a kid, you got a son or a daughter, and for those of you who are looking at me and watching me and you're on the younger side, one, thank you very much, that's awesome. Um, hopefully you like the preaching videos and hopefully you like the video game videos as well. Those video game videos are probably what drew you in to begin with, so welcome to the non-cussing, the more uh, preachy side of me. I don't think cursing is a sin, that's why I do it in the video game videos. I decided not to do that in the preaching videos just because, I don't know, the Christians would be offended if I did it in the middle of the preaching videos. And they probably don't care too much about the video game videos anyway. That's the way I see it. I could be wrong. Time will tell as the channel grows and as people start leaving more comments. We'll see. By all means, leave a comment in the description. And that was a complete tangent. I understand that. So those of you who are younger and don't have kids, or maybe you're a child yourself and I'm like, uh, having kids that thought is like completely beyond me and I don't get it. Mm, try to put yourself, well, since you are the kid, maybe you will still get this from that perspective. So you got the, you got the parent and you got the child and the child is doing something bad or something wrong. 
The parent doesn't like it. So the parent's like, hey, kid, stop doing that. That's bad. And the kid's like, no, I want to keep doing it. I don't care. Forget you. And the parent's like, okay, son, daughter, that's it. You're grounded or I'm giving you five spankings or whatever the punishment may be. And the child's like, I don't care. Go ahead and do it. I'm going to do my own thing. And the parent's like, well, fine. You know, ground, 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 spank, 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 whatever it is. Ha! I'm fine. I'm still going to do it. Well, fine. Now I'm going to ground you for longer. And you get ten spankings instead of five. Fine. I don't care. You keep doing it. I'm going to keep doing my thing. And you just have this back and forth exchange. You got the parent and you've got the kid. For some of you that may not have parents that you, and you don't perceive love from them, and they very well may not love you, for you guys this analogy is going to fall flat. The, it just kind of hit me as I was saying all that. I understand that you know I was even talking about broken homes earlier and how families are destroyed. I want to acknowledge you guys real quick. I get it. The scenario that I'm using, I'm a, the majority of parents believe it or not, care about their kids. Hopefully you have a friend of some kind where you see their parents caring for them. Hopefully you know of an adult that is loving, that is caring. So you can kind of get this analogy because if you don't have love, this analogy completely falls flat. It, it's, it's not there anymore because my whole point was the father never stops loving. God never stops loving us. I feel like I'm kind of tangenting away from my point, but I've got my timer set and I can tangent as much as I want. It's my channel. I can preach as long as I want. I can do as much as I want. You can click away whenever you want. I'm very rambly and very tangenty. So if you've watched any of my videos for any amount of time, that's who I am. And that extends not just to my video game videos, it extends to my preaching videos as well. The analogy doesn't exist if there is no love. God always loves us. And most parents... The majority of parents, from what I've seen and experienced and from what I believe, love their kids. Now, so when you're disciplining your kid, you're coming down on them because they're not being nice and they're not obeying and they need to be punished for what they're doing. And let's also assume, for the sake of this analogy, that the parent is correct and that the kid is being a stubborn brat. And you guys know, be honest, some of you guys know when you're being stubborn brats. You know when you're doing that. So the parent not only loves you, the parent is also right. And the child's just like, no, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. What I do. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so the parent does some kind of punishment. You keep disobeying, the punishment gets worse and worse and worse. And parents can make your life miserable when you're not doing what they want you to do. Or, yeah, what they want you to do. They can make your life very miserable. They can take away pretty much everything you've got because they're your parents. You live in their house. They could even take away the food if they wanted to. I think back in the day, yeah, like go to your room, you're not having dinner tonight. That was a real deal. Like back in my papa's day, going to bed without dinner, that was a legit punishment. I'm not sure if child services would be involved in that nowadays or not. Like you're starving your kid. Kid ain't gonna die from lack of one meal. I'm not saying I approve of it. I'm just saying it's not a punishment that's so severe that if child services are called on that, they should be. That really was a tangent. All of that to say God never stopped loving his kids. God always had their best intentions at heart. He always heard their complaints. He always heard their groaning and moaning. He always heard everything they had to say. He knows everything. So whether their complaint and their moaning was legitimate or not, whether they deserved what they got or not, God heard it and God cared. Just like the parent who's always loving the kid, but golly gee whiz, they are frustrated that that rebellious little brat just won't do what they say and all they want to do is raise their kid up in the, in the right way, make sure that they have what they need, make sure they're learning proper life lessons, make sure that they're going down a good path in life so that one day they can succeed and have a very good life in this world. That's ultimately the parent's goal. They want you to have a good life. They have your best interests at heart, and if you're doing something wrong, they want to correct that and steer, you, steer the kid in the right direction. I don't know why I'm pointing at me. That just kind of, that was the turn that I did. That way, the parent's happy, the child's happy, and life goes well for the child. 
ultimate, that is the ultimate goal of the majority of parents. For those of you who come from broken homes, I'm sorry if that analogy falls completely flat for you. That really does suck. Again, I hope you have some human you can look to who does care about you. Or at the very least, you've seen someone caring about another human being. Hopefully you're not completely bereft of all forms of human love and comfort. And for what it, for what it matters, probably not much, I love you. If you're grabbing some complaints on my channel, I'll try my best to respond. Right now I'm a small channel. I should be able to respond to that stuff pretty well according to the date and timestamp you see in the YouTube description. I should be able to respond to you. So, I love you. I care. I want to hear your gripes and your moans and your, and your um, moaning and complaining. I want to hear it. Give it to me. I'll listen. If you're wrong, I'll tell you. But I'll listen. I'll, and I'll talk back to you. And God will too if you give him a chance. Man, not the same way. He's not, he's not a human being like us to where he's going to speak to you like I will speak to you in the YouTube comments. But he does hear. He does care. And he will answer back if you talk to him. The caveat to all of this is that God heard them and he always cared. But he waited for them to realize that they were in sin and realize that they had to cry out to him. When they were just living for themselves and doing their own thing, God was against them. And he, did, he didn't move in to help them and to save them until they cried out to him. They heard the groaning. He heard the groaning. He heard their groaning and their complaining. But until they were willing to humble themselves and say, hey, we've sinned. God, we're sorry. Again, please help us. Until that point, he didn't come in to save the day. And that's where the, and I'll get to that in the salvation part of this message, where you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He wants to help you, but you need to acknowledge you need his help. That he does exist, for one. For those of you who may not believe he exists at all, if you want his help, you need to believe he exists. If you don't believe he exists, well, he's not going to help you out. There are some instances, and I've heard some stories where some amazing things have happened to atheists and they've turned around and believed based on those circumstances. So I understand that sometimes, even when technically he doesn't have to answer, he does anyway. Again, that's just love, mercy, and grace. Sometimes he answers when that person isn't even, you know, they may cry out to him sarcastically like, well, God, if you're there, why don't you do this? And then boom, that actually does happen. Yes, those stories are legit. I don't know how you would go about Googling that, but those stories are legit. They really do happen. Um, and that's just, that's who God is. He, he loves people, and sometimes he helps people even when they don't actually believe in him at all. Generally speaking, you have to believe in him, you have to admit that you are a sinner, and that you need help. You ask God for help because you believe he's there, you believe he cares, you believe he can help. And he does when you cry out to him for help. But he Gen again, generally speaking, there are exceptions. Generally speaking, when the, he is not called upon, and when you don't humble yourself and admit your sin, he doesn't help. In fact, he can oppose you and be against you. Finally, moving down to verse 19, And it came to pass, when the judge was dead, that they reverted and behaved more corruptly than their fathers by following other gods, to serve them and bow down to them. They did not cease from their own doings, nor from their stubborn way. Then the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he said, Because this nation has transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and has not heeded my voice, I also will no longer drive out before, any, before them any of the nations which Joshua left when he died. And that's kind of a, an echo back to verses 2 and 3 of this same chapter, Judges chapter 2. Kind of the same thing. Then verse 22 takes a different turn on this story. So that through them I may test Israel, whether they will keep the ways of the Lord, to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. So not only 
did Israel not do their part? And the Lord said, well, since you're not going to obey me and drive them out, I'll no longer help you drive them out. The Lord adds to that, not only will I not drive them out, I will now use them to test Israel, whether they will keep the ways of the Lord, to walk in them as their fathers kept them or not. So at this point, God uses the nations that are there to test Israel, to see if they will obey him or not, to see if they will turn to him or not. It may come across as like, well, what the heck is God doing? Like, you want him, you wanted them to drive him out, and so, you know, now you're not helping them drive him out. You know, they made a mistake, so now you're not going to help them. Or is the loving and forgiving God that was there? I will refer to my previous messages in this kind of sort of series. I'll leave those links in the description below. I hope that makes sense. It makes sense. You totally get it. I'll leave links to those sermons and messages down below because it's kind of a three-part thing. That is a lot to listen to. I, I get that. I understand that. But I feel like I've already addressed that in the previous episode. Um, the summary there is God fulfilled his part of the covenant. He brought them all the way out of Egypt into the promised land. He gave them strength to conquer and to fight the um, Canaanites. And a lot of the times they simply, sometimes it was hard for them to beat the Canaanites, sometimes they just didn't do their part from what I read in Scripture in Judges chapter 1. So if they're not doing their part, God isn't automatically obliged to do his part. You know, I'll bring you into the promised land. There you'll conquer the people. He brought them into the promised land. And he gave them strength to conquer many of the people. And if they had tried, if they had genuinely tried, he would have given them strength to conquer the remainder of the people. So it was a fail-fail on Israel's part. They Several times they tried to go back to Egypt. The Lord drug them there anyway. And several times they did not conquer the people that were in the land of Canaan. So just as God made them, made that old generation die in the wilderness over the course of 40 years when the trek over to Canaan, I think, was a few days or a few weeks. And instead he took them on a 40-year detour because of their disobedience. Once again, because of the disobedience, the plan changed. It goes from, oh, you're going to destroy all the inhabitants of the land to, I'm now going to use the inhabitants you left behind to test you. That wasn't the original goal. That wasn't the original form that the Lord wanted to take. But since, since they didn't do their part, he would no longer drive them out before them, and he would, in addition to that, use them to test Israel. It's like, well, if you're going to leave them there... I'll use them to see whether you'll obey me or not. I'll also use them to punish you. It doesn't say it right here, but I'll also use them to punish you when you don't obey me. Because a lot of the little sermons you've heard throughout this week, the little words of encouragement, have been where the children of Israel fell away, and then the, some, some ite comes in and oppresses them and rules over them. Eventually they cry out to the Lord, and the Lord raises up a judge to deliver them out of that person's hand. And that's the cycle repeated, excuse me, all the way up until the kings start popping in at the time of Samuel, Saul, and David. And that's another story for another time later on down the road. So ideally they would have wiped, they would have, one, not taken 40 years and gone straight to the promised land, and two, they would have wiped out all the Canaanites in the land. Since those things didn't happen, God took alternative measures. He did not, even though they broke their covenant promise, God still, in essence, upheld his end. He didn't have to take them into the promised land. Well, because of Moses' intercession, he took them in anyway. And even though they didn't fully conquer the promised land like God wanted them to, God still found a way to keep returning their land to them. It was like, it was a continual give and take. They would rebel, so he'd take it away. They'd repent, he'd give it back. They'd rebel, he'd take it away. They'd repent, he'd give it back. And it was a constant back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Hey, he's the God of the universe. He can do whatever he wants. He can give to anyone anything he chooses to give. If he wanted Israel to simply have the land, he could have just been like, blip, and, or, since it's the word of God, if you don't like the finger snap, die Canaanites and they would have all just dropped dead and that would have been it. It could have been that simple. It's not what God did. He talks to man. 
He works through man and he attempts to establish a reconnection with man that was lost at the Garden of Eden. God keeps trying to reach out to us in our fallen sinful state and tells us, hey, I love you, but you're a sinner. You need to repent. I made the way, I've made a way for you. In fact, then they didn't have Jesus. They had the whole Mosaic law and systems and sacrifices, etc., etc. But there was still a way to reach out to God. God made a way for them to reach out to him. And when they did it, he responded. When they didn't do it, he held back. And in fact, not only did he hold back the blessing, he put out catastrophe. He actually actively opposed them. He punished them. And sometimes the punishment of God, since it's not, it's not the human parent and human child um, analogy falls flat, whereas God, he's the God of the universe. He can, he can take away... He doesn't just take away your PlayStation. He can take away the money you use to pay your electric bill. He can take away your ability to move a limb of your body. He can take away your life if he so deems. And he's not unjust to do that seeing as he created you and he sustains your very being. And as a sinner, death is deserved from the very beginning of our existence. And that, I, that's definitely worth another sermon another time. But yeah, anyone, even the smallest of child, we're all born sinners. So since we're born in sin, it's never technically unjust for a sinner, even a child, to perish. That's part of the answer to why genocide in Canaan was just of the Lord to do. Hitting on some heavy topics there. But I shall digress for now to cover a little bit more ground here. So... The Lord, the Lord didn't destroy the Israelites, and he also did not destroy their enemies. He left a mixture, and he used it so they didn't fulfill their end of the covenant. He did not proceed to then drive out the Canaanites without their, without their cooperation. He left the Canaanites there, and then he further used the Canaanites to test them. There was another thing, that, and not only did he further use them to punish Israelites, there's something else he did as well. Picking up with verse 23, Judges chapter 2, verse 23, Therefore the Lord left those nations without driving them out immediately, nor did he deliver them into the hand of Joshua. Covered in a previous message, Joshua was at fault here. He did mess up. Now on to chapter 3, verse 1. Now these are the nations which the Lord left that he might test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known any of the wars in Canaan. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. Namely, five lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them, to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. So again, a repetition. He left them there to test Israel whether or not they would obey him or not. That became the new plan, so to speak. It's like, you left them, well, I'm going to use them to test you. And I'm also going to use them to punish you. And he also left them a third reason that's mentioned in verse 2. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war, at least those who had not formerly known it. So they were also left in order to teach the Israelites how to physically fight, how to conduct war. Now, that, that sounds like a terrible thing right off the bat. Uh, generally, war is not considered a good thing. I don't consider war a good thing. The Lord doesn't consider war a good thing either. However, since we humans are sinners, and God's not willing to just wipe us all out all at once, because He's loving and merciful and gracious, He allows us sinners to stay down here for a season to really draw all of us to himself, to give us all a chance to serve him or not. There's another whole sermon waiting to happen right there. And the reality is in this world there will be fighting, there will be war, there will be murder. Within the, forced, within the first four humans of this world, Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel, Cain killed Abel. So, it's, it's, well, I think about that, I'm like, it's, it's so disgusting and sick. And, and the Lord didn't stop it. He doesn't stop sin. Even sin is extreme as child abuse, or rape, or murder, or torture. 
or war. Now, I don't believe defending yourself is a sin. I'm not saying that. But for those who actively, aggressively pursue to destroy other nations for their own self-benefit, yeah. There's a problem with that. And that, that leads into the whole discussion of just war. So many good sermons that can be done at some point later on. But war is a reality in this life. To simply, to kind of wrap it up for now, war is a reality in this life. And even if the Canaanites didn't exist, there would be neighboring nations that weren't Israelites that wouldn't submit to the Lord. That the Lord could have used to teach Israel war. He was going to use something because people are sinners. People are going to sin, and people are going to stir up stuff that they shouldn't stir up. People, people, entire people groups are going to try to eliminate other people groups for their own profit or, for what, or out of spite or jealousy or false accusations or who knows what the heck else, or maybe just for the fun of it. I mean, some serial killers enjoy the thrill of the hunt. I'm sure some nations and their armies had the exact same mentality, so something even as sick as that. The Lord it was going to teach them more in some way. Since they left the Canaanites, since they didn't fulfill their end of the bargain, that's the way that's where the Lord will teach them to to fight, to conduct war, to kill other people. And who better to use than the people that they should have killed to begin with anyway? And that was an extreme statement right there as well. This channel is fun. Preaching itself in general is fun, and it's a good time. And there are so many discussions that need to be had. There are so many serious issues I want to discuss because they are important, because they are life-changing, they are life-determining. And these are heavy issues that need to be discussed and need to be talked about from whatever perspective, be it Christian or Muslim or Buddhist or Hindu or Shinto or agnostic or atheist or New Age or whatever. These are all issues we can all relate to, and they're things that we need to think about because they are important. And as a Christian, I want to do good in this world. You know, I, would, I want to promote a worldview that does promote peace, that puts an end to some bloodshed, that puts an end to enmity between family members, that puts an end to hatred between a, a parent and their child. I want to do things that promote unity, and, and love. And I believe Jesus is the way to do that. That's, he's the reason. That's the way, he's the way that I found to have peace. He's the reason I'm not in prison or dead right now. Because I was not a nice person back when I wasn't a believer. My testimony is something else that I can share in a future message at some point in some time. And by all means, leave in the description if there's a topic you want me to cover. I can't promise I'll cover it. But I can, I can guarantee definitely right now that I'll see the comments because my channel is so small. So please leave questions. Please leave troll comments. Please leave hate comments. Please leave dislikes and all that sort of stuff in the comments section. I welcome any and all of it because these are issues that affect all of us. And they need to be continually put forth in the public arena for every person and every generation in every age, every sex, every culture, every race, every language to look at, to think about, <clears throat> and to discuss. These things need to be talked about <clears throat> by everyone of all times and of all generations. And with that, I want to right now extend the hand of the Lord itself to you and offer, hey, all the things you've done wrong, that heart of stone you have, that mind that just can't get stuff right in it, the Lord wants to help you with that. And the answer to your problem is His forgiveness of your sin, the forgiveness of your bad things, of your wicked heart. And to come to Him, you've got to acknowledge that you're a sinner. You don't need, if there's nothing, if you, if you haven't done anything, then there's nothing for Him to save you from. You can't be saved if, you're, if you don't need saving. If you're in a position where there's nothing wrong, no need to be saved from anything. And I'm saying as a Christian, there is something wrong, and it's you. It's your heart. It's your deeds and your actions, your thoughts, your words. You've sinned. You've done things that are wrong. And if you're willing to believe that, and I don't really need to convince a lot of people that you guys know you've done things that are wrong. The vast majority of you will admit you've done things that are wrong. I'm telling you there's forgiveness. And God wants to wipe all of that away. And he, does, he did it 
through his son Jesus Christ who came to this world, lived a perfect life, died on a cross shedding his blood for our sin and then rose from the dead three days later, guaranteeing eternal life and forgiveness to any and all who will come to him. So just tell him you need him. Tell him you're sorry. Tell him that you do believe that he died for you and that he rose again. And if you want a model prayer to pray, something to follow word for word, let me give you something. Pray along with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. And I admit that I need you in my life right now. Please forgive me of my sin, Jesus. I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you shed your blood to forgive my sin. I believe you rose from the dead three days later and that you're alive right now and that you're hearing this prayer. Please forgive me my sin. Please come into my heart. Please be my God, my Lord, and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And if you said that prayer, you are now one of the children of God. Welcome to the family. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Try to find other people who think similarly to you. Find other believers in Christ, other Christians who also worship Jesus Christ. Find a good Bible. Whatever translation you can read, read it. Read it daily. Pour yourself into it. You want to hear God's voice? You want to see what he thinks about stuff? This is the best place to look. Covered up all sorts of controversial stuff today. And I believe I have authority to speak because I read this book. By all means, disagree with me. Read this book. Tell me where I'm wrong. Show me what I've said incorrectly. And also, make sure you talk to God every day. Just saying, hey God, how are you? Feeling a bit bummed today. Can you help me out? That's a prayer. Something as simple as that is a prayer. Pray to God every day. Pray to Him several times a day. You'll be glad that you did. Thank you guys very much for watching this episode. I love you guys, and God bless.